Well, you had asked me about the personal um, yeah. value of, of starting residency programs. And I thought of, I mean, certainly a couple things that are really exciting. I, I think I can point to three things that were really personally valuable. The first was um, that I think um, residency programs need to be run by either educators um, or administrators, both of which should be good family physicians, but you need a little bit of both. And you, of course, need to find individuals that are good and earnest teachers. And one of the things that I experienced was in, in private practice in an employed model, I did not get any extra um, system support for teaching. So that mm. having students along was not valued by the system. There wasn't a financial or time-based support to, to do teaching the right way. Um, and so in a world of burnout, that leaves you in a place where oftentimes as a, as a preceptor or a teacher, um, you just take on that burden and sacrifice yourself because it is a professional obligation. But I guess I would say that for those that are born and bred teachers that are looking for opportunities to do so in a way that is supported and protected, um, that was an incredible value to me to, to, for, for someone to recognize the time and energy it takes to teach and to do it right and then to give the space to do it. So I think that was the first thing that was really important to me. I think the second is the opportunity to build something new and design it. Um, and there's incredible value with watching something grow. Um, and we as family doctors, we watch people through the life cycle. We, we birth babies. We watch them go through and tease and then we watch, send them off to college. And so I think that there's, there's inherently something as a family physician that, that values that process of seeing things, something from birth to death. Um, and so at least Hopefully, I'll at least get to see this program from birth through life, and I, I won't um, have to worry about the death part. But, but I do think that there's there's something as a family physician that that creating a program um, is in line with what what we do um, with the life cycle that we we care for patients for. And then I think the third, the most exciting thing for me was the realization that the the harder I work, and the sooner our residency program started the more patients um, that were able to be cared for. And when I sat down and realized the, the time commitment and the effort to, to build a residency program and, and getting the program off one year earlier, um, we brought in six residents. And when I thought about it, I thought that six physicians who will graduate and they may see three to 4,000 patients in their first year of practice. So there's somewhere between 18 and 20,000 episodes of patient care that happened as a result of launching the program when we did. Yeah. That had we waited a year or two years, there would have been 15 to 20,000 less patient encounters just doing the simple math of, you know, working hard to get a program off the ground. And, and that's exciting. So that was personally validating for me. And that has been. Yeah, very cool. So you left Summit, you came in. It was a roller coaster ride to the uh, accreditation. Uh -huh. And uh, I'm just trying to think. So you had something like eight or nine months of normalcy and starting it with a brand new class of uh, residents, there's nothing normal about that. <laughs> that that's its own uh, experiment. And then, then COVID hit. Yeah. So it, it's quite a tumultuous uh, uh, year, your first year. So I think there's probably, you know, there's plenty of different ways to, to build a program. And I think one way would be to stop, design everything, take the time to build it all, and wait until you've got a bow on top to unravel it. And one of the things that I think is a challenge or concern with that approach is that 
as the years go by, and it certainly can take years to do that, you run the risk of losing momentum and interest and resources from the system level. Yeah. And so I called my program director from my own residency, and I said, if we wanted to launch this off and just have year one done really well and build it on the fly as possible, and to take the analogy of the fly um, one step further, he just said, if you're willing to build the airplane while you're flying it, it's possible. And so we started with the bones and we went back and said, what is the absolute bare minimum that we need to be able to prove that we, we can do in order to receive accreditation? One of the things that are just absolute must. So rather than take the playbook of a program that already exists and try to implement everything and try to have everything, you know, 300 pages of curriculum all ready to go before the first resident came, you know, we approach it from saying, let's let's find the bare minimum, let's create a vision of where we want to go, demonstrate that we have the foundation, and of course that foundation was predicated on a system that was willing to invest in us, and we had the resources and clinic um, to do it. So there certainly it certainly wasn't haphazard, uh, but we had to work to generate some of that energy and that momentum and resources, and then bring the residents and then empower them to be part of the change and invite them to help with crafting and creating what the second and third year can look like. And so it's it's been challenging to build something on the fly, but I think it's allowed us to to have a little bit greater momentum in the flywheel in going through the process that had we waited for two to three years or kind of held up, that we probably would have lost a lot of that energy. I think yeah. a lot of People would have come knocking on our door saying, why are we giving you all these RVUs to sit around and just write policies? So it's, it created a sense of urgency, um, and our system responded to it. Um, and it, I, I would say this, Larry. Every family doctor has to be comfortable with saying, I don't know, but I'm going to give you an answer. And so when you apply that to building a residency program, um, what, you know, what is the third year elective experience going to look like? And you say, I don't know, but I'm going to get you an answer. I mean, I think it takes a comfort and discomfort to be able to, to do that. Yeah. And we were comfortable with, with understanding we didn't have everything figured out and solved, but we conveyed that message really clearly around our health system. And for the most part, that was greeted with um, understanding. Uh, in light of COVID, that's been a real challenge because we set a, a very clear and aggressive timeline for how we we're going to design everything. And I'll tell you, Larry, COVID really reshuffled the deck for us in a lot of different ways. It pulled our faculty into the hospital when they should have been building curriculum. It pulled our faculty like myself into the COVID response when they should have been planning for um, rotation design. Um, and it pulled our residents into rotations that they weren't planned on so that their experience wasn't um, what it had, we had intended. Uh, and so that really, it was challenging, but I think it also then, it tests a program that's already adaptable and already is very um, responsive to change by virtue of starting and just going with it from scratch. Um, it made the COVID transition a little bit easier because, again, we didn't have the playbook perfectly defined. So we kind of say, hey, you know, let's just do it this way now. And that, that worked out okay. So, so far. when you said the, the, that the uh, COVID situation, it affected the residents' rotations, what happened with those? Well, the, the health system um, was running low on personal protective equipment, and so residents were deprioritized for surgeries. The volume in the emergency room was decimated, so residents that were in their emergency rotation were, really weren't needed. Um, we stopped seeing patients face-to-face -face in the clinic, and our health system had to figure out how residents could perform telemedicine and be supervised. Um, Residents were drawn into screening sites and callbacks for COVID, uh, which, you know, again, I think there's just a whole host of things 
that was not planned at all that just became part of what we accepted as a as a, a must by virtue of um, you know this change and you know the interesting thing that we found again in, in talking to some of our um, programs with mutual friends was that in other places because they had to just a solid expectation for how things work. It was, it felt like it was more challenging for them to adapt. Um, but being a new program, because we didn't have an expectation, we didn't have those traditions and standards. It kind of, in a way, felt easier to adapt. Does that make sense? Interesting. So your hospital, Meredith Health, um, did not have residents on a regular basis before this program opened up. Is that correct? Correct. So what, how were the residents received and what kind of impact has it had on the, the nurses, the docs, the administrators, the patients? Actually, one of the interesting things we found that we were, we were surprised with was the education that we had to do to fill in all the team members about what a resident is. Um, and a lot of people are really uncertain. Everybody from the billing and coding experts to the ethics team, um, to the nurses, and to be honest, even the doctors. And we were surprised that there were some physicians that had been quite a while since they finished their own residency and had to be reminded what a resident could and couldn't do, if that makes sense. Um, we have found that it's up the game in the hospital and that um, it's pressing um, different specialists to stay up to date in terms of the care they're delivering. We have say, found say that, that Say that again, say that again, please. Sure, it's up the game in the hospital and we found uh -huh. it's pressed, some specialists have shared with us that having residents has forced them to stay up to date in ways that they might not quite have been as as um, aggressive in if they were flying solo without without residents. Right. And we actually had again we're in a rural small town community and we've had feedback that the hospital was able to hire a number of specialists. And one of the the interest was I heard that you have a residency here and I want to teach. And so it actually became a, a, a tool for recruiting as well. Very cool. But it, it is something we have to work on. I mean, we're regularly trying to make sure we're out um, challenging the, the hospital culture to understand and embrace teaching. Um, and our residents have to be ambassadors to that. That's, that's a tough thing to ask a, a newly graduating resident to go and, and be an ambassador for their, um, their role. So you have to have risk takers too. So what about the uh, the C-suite? What what impact has this program had on their thinking or their uh, I guess regard for family medicine? I think I think it brings a certain energy, and I think it helps create a perception of forward thinking and innovation. I think it helps to create a perception of academic inquiry. I think the C-suite was happy to advertise that they had a national accreditation. I, I think especially for a previously naive hospital to be able to advertise that they were um, a teaching hospital now and so that the to transition from just a community-based hospital to a teaching hospital with graduate medical education or something that feels good. So if you're in the C-suite, to advertise that to the board, I think, was something that was felt good. Um, at a time when primary care is most needed, to say we're investing in primary care, and we're investing in training of primary care was, was valued. Um, 
we've been, again, we've been fortunate that our, our system really embraced it. And so that's been a two way street. We didn't have to twist their arm. And I think that that's probably an uphill battle that, that a lot of other places may struggle with. But we didn't necessarily have to twist their arm. Well, quite honestly, Aaron, um, I've watched over the years as a number of new residency programs have come on board essentially on the cheap. I mean, the C-suite wants them, but they don't appreciate the investment that's needed. So they, they start off poor, and then they're trying to chase clinical dollars to raise money for things like conferences and CME for the faculty and, you know, other things. Um, so that, I think, was a real um, asset that the the leadership invested in you guys from the get-go. That beautiful facility, the equipment, all of that. It is, and, and I again, I kind of come back to that idea of getting the right people, and that's not always. I know that's not always easy. I think one one area for success would be to try to make sure that you're hiring. If you're able to a diverse group, I think getting somebody who loves teaching, getting somebody who loves administration, getting somebody who is local. Um, I think are all, you know, so in terms of a faculty, like diversity less, well, I mean, diversity in terms of background and demographics is important, but I think trying to recruit a faculty that you have kind of like an energy or personality in a lot of different ways, I think is really valuable as well. Now, not that that's easy, but I think it's a, it's a recipe for success. So... One thing that surprised you, one thing that disappointed you. Ooh. At a time when we most need primary care and we most need family physicians, I was surprised at how many, how onerous and a responsibility creating an initial application of the ACGME was. I want to be careful how I say that because I don't want to condemn the ACGME. I, mean, I think that maybe the way to, to couch it would be that, um, that I really don't want to sound negative towards ACGME. Uh, I think I think I would just say something more to the effect of there seem to be a lot more barriers than open pathways to inspire a new and budding program. And that was a surprising challenge to me at a time when we're calling on creating more family medicine. Um, so that, that maybe disappointed me. Um, uh, the, this past week, we welcomed our second class this past month. And Larry, we watched, um, now this point is a 666 program, 12 residents walk um, down the hall all in their white coats. And just there's such a real value and virtue in seeing the 12 of them walking. You know, they all came here to train here in the program that we built. Um, and they're all blending together and their lives are intermixing. And then they're going to all come and touch hundreds of lives here in the community, thousands of lives. And there's something that was really almost poetic to me about standing um, paces behind them and walking and just seeing them all come and intermix. And so that that certainly was was a really just incredible moment to imagine um, the the time and effort and energy to build a program and then seeing the group come together and then um, go out and take care of a community. It's, it's I mean it's been an awesome area. It's been really really amazing. That's very cool. Very cool. Yep. So, anything else you think it's important for to be in this story?
I think I've shared an awful lot of the things that really, really poignant for me as I've thought through this. I can't okay. think of, I, I really wanted to do the best I could with this to really offer as clear a picture about where we're coming from. And, and I guess for me, rather than just make it a feel good story about something that sounds good, I really wanted to try to offer some salient points that someone could latch onto and, I hope that that this helps a little bit. You know, well, I think that, you know, again, I think more than have. yeah, more than just a feel-good article to be able to say, here are three things that you need to consider. You know, here's five things as you're building a program to to seek to, to implement. Um, let's see. Hmm. No, I think that's pretty good. I think that's a good place to start. Um, I'll be eager to see what comes together, you know, between an hour with Doug and Paul and me and see what, what that leads to. And again, I really hope, I hope it's more of a playbook with a case study than a feel good story. Right. If that's possible, because I think, you know, when we actually, when we went through, there's an article from maybe around 2012 or 2014 that talks about the pathway to build a family medicine residency. And it's really well done. Um, but it only talks about the, like the objective things like do this, then this, and then this. Um, and so the, the substance, the energy, the, you know, the partnerships, the community, the, the leadership part just weren't even touched in that. And I think I, I mean, I scoured the literature, Larry, and there was nothing on this topic that, that offered anything more than just kind of a blueprint about yeah what, what you should expect from a timeline. And so if, if we could build out almost like a case study, um, you know, similar to what like the Harvest, Harvard Business Review does, yeah. something like that, that's what, it could yeah, actually that's what be pretty rich. Could be pretty rich. I think so too. I think so too. And here's the other thing: what will happen is Ron and I will put our heads together and we'll come up with a first draft, and okay. then we'll bring it back to you guys, and not only to make sure that we got things right, but also that we got the right style for the story, the right material in there. Some ideas may come to mind um, as you see, see things and, and we can shape it. So we'll, we'll, we'll be doing this together. Okay. That sounds great. Hey, the other thing I wanted to talk with you about is we haven't talked about the dreams of the founders for a long time. No, we haven't. And Allie and I um, last connected a couple of weeks ago, um, but the three of us should probably get together. Of course, you know we got the fellowship, and then of course, with everything else in COVID, they said, "Hey, the center's closed. You can come in the spring." Um, so just at least know that was the timeline they had presented to us. Um, but as far as where we are now and what we what what we do next, I think bringing Allie on board would be a good idea. Okay, I can try to set up a three-way. She's finishing her fellowship with the FMEC, but she's still willing to, you know, stay involved in this. And and I have this crazy idea that I wanted to run by you. Uh huh. What about an evening with? A founder, like a Zoom, it, yeah. And you know, oh, we that's would, cool. We would ask people, "You want to spend an evening with John Guyman? You want to spend an evening with Bob Rakel? Want to spend an evening with uh, Bob Taylor?" Oh, that's a great idea. Oh, and I, I don't know. Wonderful. I don't know if we bring them together. You know, like with groups, there, there's enough of them out there that would um, probably say yes, like the three I mentioned. But, um, oh, and the other thing is we did not interview Bob Rakel, um, but I think he would be another good one. The other good one is Ed Shahady. Do you know Ed? I interviewed Ed Shahady. Did you really? Oh, you did interview him? I did. Oh, I did good, interview good, Ed, good. yeah. Okay. Yep, I interviewed Ed. Good. I was afraid that we forgot. I I didn't go back and look at the list. 
But I'd be willing yep, to get a hold of uh, Bob Rakel and see if we could get a time with him to do an interview, if you're up for that. Oh, I think Bob would be great. He's written a couple of things that have just been masterful in my mind. I'd love to connect with him. Okay. Good. And I think this evening... And I, go ahead. I do think an evening with dot, 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 in light of COVID would be kind of a fun way to go about this, right? I think that's kind of 